So, uh, so a lot of you are quantum folks. I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, something which is classical, and I'm going to talk about algebraic circuit complexity. And uh, one of the main motivations for me to give this talk is to rather show a lot of open problems in this area. So we have solved, I mean, we're making attempts to solve a lot of them, but still a lot of questions are still open. And uh, I thought like, you know, what, what better place to uh, tell, tell a bunch of open questions than here, right? So, so let's start with what is the context of this talk. So we'll start with the, the model of computation, which is, uh, yeah, the model of computation is arithmetic circuits, the algebraic circuits. So, so they're, they're supposedly called algebraic circuits. Arithmetic circuits are the ones where you actually put in constants and you evaluate the uh, evaluate certain uh, operations. But like you know, we're going to call them algebraic circuits or arithmetic circuits in this talk. Both mean the same for this talk. Right? So, well, these are directed to cyclic graphs where the leaves are the uh, what do you call the leaves are labeled either by variables or constants, and every non leaf node is labeled by a multiplication or an addition. Right? So this is the setup. This is a, this is your model of computation and uh, you can choose to pass the constants along the edges. So you need not always pass the constants along the uh, leaves, but you can always pass it through the edges as well. That's fine for us. So we're looking at circuits with constants. And uh, every node computes an algebraic operation. So you have uh, every node computes a polynomial a polynomial operation on its inputs. Right? And then uh, you, com you compute a polynomial at the end. Right, so this generates a polynomial. You can think of this as symbolic generation of polynomials. Right, so again, there's a circuit size. There's a notion of uh, what do you call complexity. Yeah, tell me. Uh, is that finally in Chu or in Yeah, Bion so I'll, I'll come to that. So at this point of time, we don't really mandate what the final is. So we are fine with any final for the moment. Right, so and uh, the circuit size happens to be the measure of complexity because the number of algebraic operations that you're doing becomes your measure of complexity. And like circuit depth also happens to be an important part in the results that we look at. So we'll say like, you know, what's the longest leaf to root path? So, and then uh, we have formulas which are directed as cyclic graphs, uh, which are trees. So what does this mean is like, you're not reusing the computation. So you, you, you every node computes a polynomial, but you're not reusing it again. It's somewhere else. If you have out degree two, that means you're reusing the computation. So that's the uh, semantic difference. And as it turns out, like these are a natural model for. So this is a this is a slide I sell uh, where I sell arithmetic circuits. So they're a natural uh, model of representation as well. So given given any uh, given any number, rather let's say given any point, I can evaluate it. I evaluate the circuit at a point which is very natural. You have a flow of computation from the leaves to the root. And uh, well, non zeroness So let, let's uh, push this non zeroness under the carpet because you can do it in randomized polynomial time, but like doing it in deterministic polynomial time is still a very wide open question. You can do algebraic operations, in additions, multiplications, compositions, and everything. These are natural operations which, which are good on circuits, and uh, they also are succinct for a lot of operations. So, so algebraic circuits are not only a model of computation; they're also a model of representation. So, right, so, so analogous to P versus NP, there is this notion of algebraic P versus algebraic NP. So where the V comes from valiant, like the valiant was a, at least the first person to formally study uh, algebraic complexity classes. So Schnorr had this idea back in the day, but like, you know, valiant uh, formalized this notion, thusly valiant. And, uh, so BP again is a class of polynomials which are efficiently computable. So by efficiently computable, I mean polynomial size arithmetic circuits. There's also this restriction that you're only considering polynomials with bounded degree. So if I give you a polynomial size circuit, I could possibly compute uh, a very high exponential degree polynomial, but let, let's, let's uh, think of BP to be bounded degree polynomials. Bounded degree polynomials which are efficiently computable. And on the, like on the other hand, we have B and P. So, so NP was something which was efficiently verifiable in some sense, and now we have something called efficiently definable. So, when I say efficiently definable, I can say like you know, if you give me a monomial, maybe I can tell you uh, what the coefficient is, 
So that's one of the notions of efficient definability. So it's like a succinct definability in some sense. So, so, so for example, if you give me permanent, so I can verify if the uh, if this given a monomial, I can verify if it actually corresponds to a, a permutation or not. Right. So, and then I like you know, it's, and then I know what the coefficient is if it's a permanent one. It's, it's all ones. Right? So there are like this is a class of efficiently definable, but at the end of the day, what this class happens to be is anything that is a that can be reduced to permanent, rather any polynomial that can be expressed as permanent of a small matrix whose entries are either uh, constants or variables. Right? So let's say for, for now, efficiently definable. So these are called uh, predefinable by valiant. And there's a whole bunch of polynomials which are in this class. Right? So, so this is a very wide open question and like you know, permanent versus determinant has been studied in various contexts. Like, you know, so as it turns out, apparently there are people in physics who are studying this, people who are, because it relates to something in statistical mechanics and then uh, statistical physics. And uh, we study it for computational purposes because it relates to sharp P versus uh, low complexity classes. And uh, so mathematicians have their own because two ends of the eminence are uh, determinant and the permanent. So that makes more sense for mathematicians to study permanent versus deter determinant. And so you have this whole, uh, what do you call plethora of problems, which are, so it's again asks P versus NP, this is a very wide open question to understand what is the complexity? Like where is the boundary of this complexity? Right. So where does the, the easily computable stop and where the hard to compute starts? Right? So this is kind of a question that has been open in theoretical computer science since ages. So as I said, like you know, there are many polynomials of interest. So the polynomials of interest are determinant, permanent, say Hamiltonian cycle polynomial. So as you can see, determinant and permanent are very easy. I mean, very related except for the signs. So even there's a, there's a whole class of polynomials between uh, determinant and permanent called eminence. So, and there's a Hamiltonian cycle polynomial. So uh, there's a reason why I have mentioned Hamiltonian cycle pol polynomial because permanent and determinant are the same when you work over F2. In the sense that the sign uh, like minus one and one are the same. So, so even though when, when I say permanent is, is a hard problem, like it's in uh, VNP, when you, when you restrict yourself to F2, you have to have a different polynomial because determinant and permanent are the same. And determinant has an easy computation over all fields. So, which is why you say like, you know, this is the reason why I said Hamiltonian cycle pol polynomial where your polynomial is defined over, so I, I'm going to, like the summation is over instead of all permutations, I'm going to take one cycles. So look at all permutations which are one cycles. And corresponding to that, I'm going to define a monomial. So this is my Hamiltonian cycle polynomial. And this also happens to be uh, VNP complete. Right? So this is yeah. If you can write down your your polynomial like in this kind of succinct way, then it's always in VNP. Actually, yes. Okay. So so th that's another thing that I've pushed into the carpet. Yes. Okay. So as long as so it's not exactly the same. Uh, there are variations like you can. There's a specific way of writing your exponential summations given a polynomial f. I can write as an exponential summation of uh, some easily computable polynomials, and you're good. Okay. So, so there's a there's a characterization that evolved, like first val uh, valiant defined, and then uh, Peter Bergeser actually modified this de definition and gave a more generic. So, at the end of the day, what happens is like anything that is in VNP happens to have a, a permanent expressibility in the sense that you can write it as a permanent of a matrix whose entries are either constants or variables. And the matrix is not a not a very, uh, I mean it's a polynomial size matrix in the number of variables. Right. So, so that's a like one line definition of VNP. So there are multiple characterizations. Like the initially VNP was defined using uh, Turing machines. It said given a monomial, like you know, uh, the monomial defines a string and its coefficient actually uh, the coefficient actually computes the number of accepting paths of a Turing machine on that input. So that is the original, uh, original definition given by Valley, but now we have a much more succinct way of seeing things. And uh, as it turns out, like you know, we, we are looking for lower bounds. And uh, so we want, so we want to show that permanent is a hard polynomial. That means we, we want to say that permanent cannot be computed by polynomial sized arithmetic circuits. Right. So what does that mean? So I want to, 
again, so there was this uh, famous lower bound of Shannon, which says, like, you know, uh, you cannot, I mean, there are, there are Boolean functions, which cannot be computed by roughly two to the n by n. So there's a constant there, but roughly two to the n by n by using this counting argument. Right? So this counting argument also translates to the algebraic setting where uh, there, there are hard polynomials. So there are hard polynomials, uh, which needs, if I, if I have D, which is growing function of n, so whenever you use a capital N, that means the number of variables. And whenever you use a small d, it's a degree of the polynomial of n and a question. So now there, there is an existential circuit size lower bound which says there exist polynomials which are hard. That means these polynomials require exponential uh, arithmetic circuits, exponential size arithmetic circuits. However, this is the same problem that we have with p versus np that like, you know, given a polynomial, so given a function which is hard, so there exists a function that is hard, but I don't know whether that exists in VN, uh, NP, right? Same same case happens here. Right? Yeah, the, it's exponential on the different D rates. Yeah, uh, depending on uh, what my N and D, how, how they're related. Yeah, because you said first that the degree was bounded. Yeah, degree was bounded, yes. <laughs> but now it's exponential on the degree D, not on N. No, it's, so, so if I could have fewer variables than the degree, mm -hmm. Then it then this would uh, become uh, d to the so d to the n, right? So so the, so uh, the combinatorics tells me it's n plus d choose d. But how do, how do you approximate this exponentially? Is depending on how n and d are related. Mm -hmm. So which, whichever one is the smallest one that that goes into the exponent. Ah, oh, okay, sure. So, so yeah, so it's so it's that that's the reason. It's, this is the cleanest way of stating it. So, so this comes from uh, like you know some sort of algebraic arguments. These are like uh, so this is some sort of algebraic independence argument. How you get this? So, but again, I don't know. We are we are looking for lower bounds against explicit polynomials, right? So when I say explicit again, which which are easily definable. So, but I don't know what like there exists a polynomial which is hard, but I don't know where that lies. Right? So that is not exactly the kind of polynomial that we're looking at. We want to look at polynomials which are easily definable. I mean, so you'll always have things which are hard, but we want things which are hard with this particular structure. How do the best known circuit size lower bounds are uh, super linear as, as with uh, Boolean complexity, you have lower bounds which are very weak. So, so for those who, who also do machine learning, this Bauer and Strassen also happens to be uh, familiar because there's this backpropagation algorithm which uses this similar techniques as a slow bound. So there's a complexity of first order partial, partial derivatives which are involved and then like, so it, it, I was surprised to know that, know that algebraic complexity also has, uh, what do you call these results also have applicability in machine learning. So, so However, if you consider, uh, so this is a circuit size lower bound, but if you restrict yourselves to formulas, then like you have n square. I'm in similar situation as with Boolean circuit complexity, right? So like things are wide open. Yeah. So, so how, so as with, uh, so back in eighties and nineties, uh, a lot of Boolean circuit complexity researchers have actually focused on constant of circuits, constant of the, uh, uh, so they've looked at AC0, then AC0 parity. And then like, you know, they started getting more and more and more results. But however, the, the results are slow to come by over the last 40 years. So the results have slowed down, right? So then people started looking, in 92, uh, Valiant actually wrote a paper which says, why is Boolean complexity so difficult? Right? And then in, the, in this paper, what he says is, well, if you want to prove PE versus NP, so the reason why people started look complexity theory start, start, started looking at circuits is because circuits are a more natural way of thinking about functions. Every function can be computed by Boolean circuits, and uh, it is sufficient to prove a Boolean circuit size lower bound uh, to prove p not equal to n. So I can say I'll take a function which is in uh, which is in NP. Let's say Hamiltonian cycle. Again, easy example. So this function takes as input a, a matrix, zero one matrix, which defines the adjacency graph of a, of a graph. And then you ask, does this graph have a Hamiltonian cycle or not? Given exponential time, I can actually list out the truth table and then I can uh, come up with 
an exponential size circuit for this. Now you ask, like, is there a succinct representation? Does it have a polynomial size circuit for it? Or does it not have polynomial size circuit? If I can do this, then that is sufficient for my P versus NP. If, if, if one can say that Hamiltonian cycle polynomial, uh, sorry, Hamiltonian cycle function has a polynomial size Boolean circuit, that means P is equal to NP. And if it doesn't, P is not equal to NP. Right? So then, like, you know, uh, Valiant, Valiant then said, oh, well, I mean, we have been struggling to prove Boolean circuit size lower bounds. Maybe we can actually look at arithmetic circuit size lower bounds. Like, arithmetization was a trick that actually came in around the same time, like, around, like you know, around the same time, arithmetization has been very popular. So first you convert your, uh, an arithmetic circuit, sorry, Boolean circuit into an arithmetic circuit. So this arithmetic circuit computes a polynomial, but this, this polynomial matches this function on zero and inputs. Rest, we don't care. It could be a very arbitrary function, arbitrary values, right? So, or you can think of this as this arithmetic circuit, uh, which is over F2 quotiented by X square, X square minus X, right? So this is an algebra, you're considering this over an algebra, quotient algebra, which is not very natural for algebraic uh, operations. So people said, okay, let's drop the uh, coefficient thing. Let's look at circuits, algebraic circuits over fields. So maybe we can actually come up with results. We can come up with low bounds over computation of polynomials syntactically, and then come back to Boolean circuit context. So we'll talk about how do you come back, right? So, so the first step happens to be proving circuit size lower bounds in the algebraic setting is what valid actually. Right? So I'll illustrate how this back and forth happens in a bit, right? So, so far, uh, so then circuit size lower bounds are well looked at and uh, a lot of restricted arithmetic circuits. So some of the restrictions that were considered are say, so one of the most popular restrictions is the multilinear restriction, right? So you have every Boolean function has a polynomial which is multilinear, right? So, so it, there's a polynomial that, com that computes the exact, so suppose I can take a function, there's a multilinear polynomial whose evaluations are equivalent to this function over the Boolean hypergroup. Right? So there exists a unique multilinear polynomial. So multilinear, so now you, you take this algebraic circuits and on every node, you restrict, uh, so every node you restrict your computation to be multilinear. So that's, so that's what uh, people started calling syntactic multilinear. You're syntactically generating only a multilinear polynomial. So you're not generating any terms which are of degree greater than two, I mean, individual degree greater than two, greater than one. And so this is a very strong restriction. And then it has proven to be fruitful. I mean, people were able to, so starting with RAS, then like, you know, so, we've done a lot of work in multilinear circuits, a lot of uh, formula low bonds are known. So let, let me be more clear, the formula low bonds are known and constant depth, uh, constant depth multilinear circuit low bonds are known. Right? So this is a work that started with RAS and then like I also jumped into the bandwagon a few years ago. So we have a bunch of results. Then there's a, so along with multilinear, there is this, you see this multi arc so multi arc is a generalization of multilinear. Now you could prove results when you bound your individual degree to be one. So the next natural step is to say like, you know, I'm going to generalize my circuit model from multilinear to something say multi quadratic. So I can compute polynomials of degree at most, individual degree at most two, right? Can I show low bounds in this setting? So the ultimate aim is to keep increasing this value of R to something as large as possible. Right? So, so you, you have a constraint. Now you want to weaken your constraint step by step. Right? So, so maybe this could help. And this is a bandwagon I've been in the, in the past four to five years. So I have some uh, low bounds in uh, multi arc circuits as well, but that is not relevant for this talk. So I'm just moving on. But like there have been a lot of restrictions that have been considered. And one of the important restrictions that has been considered is constant depth and bounded finite. Right? So this is the result of Agrawal and Vinay. But say it's like you know it's sufficient to prove circuit lower bounds for depth four circuits, right? So this is what is called a depth reduction. You say a general arithmetic circuit can be reduced to depth four, and it has a non-trivial depth four size. So to put it in parameters to be more uh, formal, if you start with a circuit of size s and degree t, you can come down to a depth four circuit of size s to the root t, 
And if S were polynomial, polynomial in NND, so it's roughly N poly in NND to the power of root B. Right? So, so you have a non-trivial depth four circuit, and now it is sufficient to show lower bounds against this depth four circuits. So you, you had a sufficient criteria from uh, P versus NP to Boolean circuits. From Boolean circuits, you went to algebraic circuits. Then this, so for algebraic circuits, the sufficiency condition is this depth there four. Yeah, this might seem a lot. Like this might this might seem a lot of simplification, but even this is very difficult, right? So these things are being very difficult. So I mean, the way Agarwal and Vinay uh, stated this, this is Manindra Agarwal and uh, Vinay, the way they have stated this is. Oh, the reason why we are finding it difficult to show constant depth lower bounds is because we are, I mean, this is as good as showing general circuit lower bounds. Right? So this is so this is as hard as a general problem. So that's the way they thought about it. And then a bunch of us opt optimists, we said, oh, this is sufficient. So let's just look at this. Right? So this is like an optimistic versus pessimistic view of uh, proving lower bounds. Right? So, so let's, so, so we have. So uh, the reason why I've showed this uh, landscape is that we have low bounds under these restrictions, right? So what can we do with these low bounds, which are uh, uh, which are in the restricted setting? They may not be giving us the general arithmetic circuit size low bounds, but maybe they could be useful for something else, right? So so this is where this functional lower bounds come in, right? So so far our lower bounds have been about so given a polynomial. What is the complexity of generating symbolically generating it, right? So I'm going to I'm going to make this uh, notion of lower bound a bit more stronger in the sense that I'm going to ask what is the complexity of not only generating that that specific polynomial but any polynomial that is equivalent to functional. So so to be uh, so I'm going to fix a domain or a subdomain, right? I'm going to say suppose I'm working on a feed. And I'm, I'm going to fix my subdomain to be uh, zero one. So a hypercube. Any any field has zeros and ones, and I'm, I'm going to fix this uh, uh, zero zero one to the n as my uh, space of evaluations, right? So if two functions are equivalent, then they're equivalent over the entire space. If they're not equivalent, then it is sufficient to find a witness somewhere. Right? So so sufficient to find a witness where they're not equivalent. So I'm going to say like the two polynomials are functionally equivalent. So in, in a very weak sense, if they're, so I'm going to say if they're equivalent over the smaller evaluation space, I'm good. Right? So because that is where I'm trying to find a witness that they're not equal. So, uh, so this is a very stronger notion of uh, algebraic uh, low bounds in the sense that a syntactic low bound is saying, what is the, what is the complexity of generating this polynomial? It may so happen that there might be another polynomial which is equivalent to this polynomial over this Boolean hypercube, which may be easy to compute. So a low bound for this particular polynomial may not translate to another polynomial which is functionally equivalent. An upper bound translates, not the lower bound. Right? So, so actually doing this may actually lead to some low bounds for Boolean circuits. Right? So, so let's say, so here all I'm saying is. I have two polynomials which are functionally equivalent. That means their evaluation tables are same. On the other hand, so, and then when I say a functional lower bound, so I'm going to say this, the given circuit or the given circuit family with a particular size limit cannot compute that polynomial or any polynomial that is equivalent to this polynomial. So it's, it's a more generic way of thinking about lower bounds. Right? So it's you're not only compute you're not only able to compute that uh, polynomial of interest, but any polynomial that of uh, that is functionally equivalent to this polynomial also happens to be hard in this notion of low bounds. And this is the notion of low bounds that we need to think about to to show low bounds for the Boolean circuits. Right? So Boolean circuits low bounds are functional low bounds. You're saying that if I if a circuit cannot compute a function, that means it cannot compute the evaluation table. Or if a circuit computes a function, that means it's able to, uh, their uh, evaluation tables are uh, same, equivalent, right? So this is the kind of low bounds that we are looking at. And uh, so, in, so I'll just say, what are the functional low bounds known? And I'll say, how is this related to Boolean complexity? So some of the uh, previously known functional low bounds are, 
So anything that is to do with the multilinear circuits, uh, any multilinear low bounds are also functional, right? So, so this crucially uses the fact that two, if two polynomials are equivalent over the Boolean hypercube and they're multilinear, they're the same polynomial, right? So I have two multilinear polynomials and if they're uh, the same over the entire hypercube, then they're the same polynomial. So if you are showing a lower bound, in the syntactic setting, that also translates to a, a functional setting as well. So this is a part and parcel of the, the way the technique introduced by Ras. Ranias. So there's something called a, uh, there's a partial derivative matrix, which is also equivalent to an evaluation matrix. I, I'm going to push it under the top, but if you're interested, I'm, I'm going to expand it on a little bit. So, so one of the very crucial uh, low bounds in functional setting is given by Gregorio and Rasperos. So this is uh, for depth. So when I say sigma pi sigma, that means it's a sum of product of linear forms. Right? So that is my uh, circuit model. And when I say F, so this is a very lazy notation. It's like, you know, for any fixed size finite field. And this fixed size finite field happens to be very crucial for the arguments. Right? So, and uh, the subdomain that they consider is not Boolean hypercube. But something, so it's actually F star, right? So they're looking at uh, functional low bounds over F star. Right? So this is a, and there are some restricted depth three and depth four low bounds from uh, like Michael Forbes, uh, Mrinal, and uh, Ram Ramdasa Satyajit. Right? So, so let me define how it is connected to the Boolean circuit complex. So this is the. Uh, there is this notion of Boolean parts of polynomials. So this Boolean part of polynomials was defined the rather first uh, used by Peter Burgesser and uh, Burgesser, like how you pronounce, I, I'm not very sure how he pronounce his name, but so Peter defined this uh, notion of Boolean parts of polynomials. So that means a Boolean part of a polynomial is a function that simulates the evaluation of this polynomial over the Boolean hypercube. Over the zero one to the n. So I let, like Boolean hypercube is actually a misnomer, like let's say over zero one to the n. Right. So not every polynomial may have this Boolean Boolean part because uh, the cons the constants may not be precise. I mean the constant may not be bounded. So you may have uh, you may have a polynomial which uses uh, constants which are hard to hard to be hard to keep track of, let's say, for the computation. Suppose I'm using a constant which is complex, right? It doesn't make sense to define, uh, uh, I can define complex as well. If, if I use something irrational, so irrational is where things start falling, uh, falling apart. So not every, every polynomial may have a Boolean part, but like we'll define Boolean parts for those which, for which we can define that is sufficient for us. And as it turns out, you can define a Boolean part for the entire class of uh, polynomials. So it's just, so uh, the Boolean part of a class happens to be the Boolean part. It's a, uh, what you call it, it's a set of Boolean parts of uh, the circuits in that class. Yes. So this uh, calligraphic C happens to be a class of circuits. And uh, the capital C is a circuit. So for all those cal uh, circuits in the calligraphic C, so we can uh, define the Boolean part to be the, the set of Boolean parts of the uh, circuits in the class. Right? So it's just a definition which is overloaded. Yeah. So now, uh, so basically, Peter Bergeson actually, uh, you know, he argued about this. So if you assume GRH, right? So GRH is a pretty heavy tool that, that you to assume. So we say, like, you know, over large fields, so the Boolean parts of VP, they lie sandwiched be between functional NC, NC1 and functional NC3 in the non-uniform setting, right? And uh, VNP lies between sharp P and uh, FP to the sharp P. Uh, uh, remind your hypothesis. So this actually implicitly uses this result by Pascal Kora, which very, he says like, if a system was solely, it's, I don't think I should attribute it, but it's, it's a Pascal Kora's result he says in Hilbert Nestle and Sats is an AM. 
So where it says if you have a system of polynomial equations over uh, large fields. So if you assume GRS, then if a system of solutions is satisfiable over complex numbers, then there exists a prime, which is not very large, or is the same system of solutions, a system of polynomial equations will be satisfiable modulo that prime. So this is a, so this argument implicitly uses that kind of, a, so Peter actually starts building a system of polynomial equations and then says, oh, if I have large fields, I don't know how to deal with the constants. Maybe I may have uh, this constants coming up, to, like when I may go from uh, polynomials to functions, then this constant also I need to keep track of, right? So maybe I'll not be able to handle it computationally, but if you assume GRS, you, you can actually translate it to another system of equations, which is equivalent and it's uh, satisfying. Mm -hmm. No, no, this is only for the expressibility. It's not about uh, efficiency of computation. It's only the translation. Yeah. So there, there could be, so all this says is, yeah, so this is expressibility. You're not transforming it. No, actually you can go, you can go back and forth come efficiently. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. So the results happen to be, so if you go from uh, the Boolean size, so this inclusion, for example, like uh, NC1 and uh, BPOVP inclusion, this comes using arithmetization. And this, this side comes from uh, some sort of uh, modular arithmetic. Yeah, you can go back and forth. So this is maybe it's just a uh, slightly too general question, but the, it feels to me that the VP versus VNP doesn't really seem like an equivalent of P versus MP. It's more like an equivalent between like it's not sharp true. L versus sharp P or L versus P. Yeah, so we'll come to that in a bit. But it's more like Gapel versus uh, yeah. sharp P. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about, yeah, so I'll, I'll come to that in a bit. And so, so there are this like kind of function. So, so this is something known. So basically, this also lets us believe that VP is not equal to VNP. If VP were to be equal to VNP, then uh, uh, sharp, so this FP to the sharp P will be equal to NC3. Right? So this is also a notion. Uh, so in particular, we'll actually look at Boolean circuits, which are constant F, and see how to prove lower bounds using algebraic circuit lower bounds. So what is this ACC zero? ACC zero is ha happens to be constant of arithmetic, uh, constant of Boolean circuits over, over and or not and modular fields. Right? So this is a like a very well studied class. And uh, in the uniform setting, so there is a result by Eric Allender and Vivek, Vivek Goyal. And uh, what they showed is like, you know, permanent cannot be computed by uniform ACC zero. This actually gives you a separation from, uh, separation between sharp P and uh, AC0 in the uniform setting. Yeah, what does the uniform setting mean? Huh, so uniform setting versus non-uniform setting. Uniform setting, uh, so for example, if, I, if I'm talking about circuit classes, so I'll have given any N, so when I talk about uniform setting, given any N in unary, I should be able to give the circuit size, there should be an algorithm, efficiently computable algorithm that is going to give you the circuit of size N. For rather, rather than saying size N, for the input of length n, mm -hmm. right? Whereas, whereas in non-uniform setting, you can actually get some advice for every n, which is a polynomial element. And you can use this advice to build the circuit. Or you can think of it as somebody else is giving you the circuit for length n. So that is, by poly means you're getting some help from uh, outside. So there's some oracle giving you advice, you can think, think of it that way. Right, and then uh, there is really celebrated result, which is saying, uh, next, not in non-uniform is zero. So, okay, so there is a reason why I'm talking about non-uniform circuit problems. Because when you talk about algebraic complexity theory, so it's all it's always non-uniformness that is actually coming up. Right? So these are non-uniform models of computation. So it makes sense to th think, so non-uniform also happens to be a more generic way of thinking about circuits. Right? So, Whereas uniform actually restricts you saying, oh, if you are if you are of a particular uh, input length, then I should be able to efficiently give you the circuit. Whereas in the other thing, there will be a circuit. You don't know what the circuit representation is like. There's, we don't uh, think about what the uh, complexity of 
actually coming up with the circuitous. So these are two different notions. We'll actually look at the non-uniform circuit. So there's an oracle which is giving you uh, giving us the circuit or circuit description or something to help uh, build the circuit. Okay. So so we'll uh, so that actually pushes away the complexity of coming up with the circuits under the carpet. Right. So now we have. Uh, this really celebrated result. And then uh, there is, next was a very big class. And then uh, uh, a couple of years later, um, rather 2014 and six years later, uh, so I think there's a journal versions, but I think the actual timeline is much shorter. So they said non-uniform quasi-polynomial time is not in non-uniform ACC. So these are really big classes. And uh, when you look at the uniform uniform version versus non-uniform version, like you have a Sharpie versus ACC zero separation. Whereas you have next or MQP versus uh, ACC zero separation. Right? So these are like, so to just give you context, like Sharpie can be done in exponential time. Right? So, so if you actually use the definition that you can, so Sharpie corresponds to number of, uh, counting the number of uh, accepting paths of a Turing machine, just run the Turing machine over all the inputs, right? So it's like, you know, so rather wait, so yeah, you can do it in exponential time. So not, you don't run it over all the inputs, you run it over all the witnesses, right? So, so, uh, so Sharpie counts the number of accepting paths of a Turing machine. So, the accepting paths are given by non-determinism. Instead of non-determinism, you actually go, the, go to the branches uh, deterministically and you can do it in exponential time. Right? So that is the... So now, but uh, there is a character... So one of the crucial results that is used in all of these results is this characterization for ACC0. Right? So there is this characterization for ACC0, which is given by... First given by Yao. So, and then it was got refined by Miguel and Tess. It says any function in the ACC0 can be computed using a deterministic depth two circuit. And this determinant the depth two circuit has a symmetric gate at the top and the AND gates at the next layer. Right? So, and it's even more precise in the sense that the number of gates AND gates feeding into the symmetric gate is uh, quasi-polynomial in A. And each AND gate has a fanning of at most polylog. Right? So there is a so you may have a constant of circuit, which is arbitrary, but there's an equivalent. So the same function can be computed by another depth two circuit, which may be of uh, quasi polynomial size instead of polynomial size, right? And which is much more structured. So if you want to show lower bounds against ACC zero, it is sufficient to show lower bounds against this deterministic depth two circuits. So why, why is it deterministic? Because the original uh, Yao's construction was actually randomized. Right, so, okay, so how, uh, so you had Boolean circuits. Now, we, so again, use arithmetization. You come to, so it was actually a symmetric function into which a lot of AND gates go. And uh, what is known using arithmetization is that every symmetric function can be expressed as a univariate polynomial over, uh, the univariate polynomial is over sum of inputs. So any symmetric function can be written as a unitary polynomial over reals, let's say, or a large field. So where this unitary polynomial, this the variable, the univariate variable, happens to be the sum of inputs of this function. Suppose I have a epsilon which is on x1 to xn. I'm going to have a univariate polynomial on z where z is equal to summation of xn. That, that does it make sense? So because it doesn't matter. Uh, so all you care about in a symmetric function is the weight of the input. It doesn't matter what, what the individual bits are. Right? So this function can be translated to a, a unitary function on the weight of the, uh, weight of the uh, inputs. Right? And, and can be arithmetized to a product. So what happens is like under this assumption, you can actually con uh, convert your Boolean circuit into an algebraic circuit, which can be, uh, which can be as follows. It's a sum of powers of low degree polynomials. Okay. So you have uh, sums of powers of low degree polynomials and 
any function that can be computed using AC0 can also be computed using this sums of powers of low degree polynomials. Right, this is an equivalent representation. So you had a, a Boolean circuit representation and you have an algebraic representation for the same, same function. So you said, like initially, if you started with the polynomial size AC0, then this would translate to a quasi-polynomial algebraic circuit, which is sums of powers of low degree polynomials. And uh, as it turns out, we've been able to prove really good low bounds over constant arithmetic circuits, over uh, bounded degree arithmetic circuits and whatnot, right? So, so this was a motivation saying, oh, this is not very different from what we have been doing. So maybe we can actually uh, like you know, compute some uh, maybe compute some low bounds against this class of uh, this class of circuits. Okay. So, so we'll call these expressions of this form sums of powers of low degree polynomials to be like a sigma wedge sigma pi, where this wedge is the powering, and the bottom the the rightmost sigma pi happened to be the sums of monomials, right? And this wedge is like powering them. So this is like if you actually go from top to the leaf, root to the leaf, it's like sum powering sum and then product. So that's how the, uh, the circuits are. Or you can uh, equivalently see it's sums of powers of uh, low degree polynomials. So how many, so what is this S? This S is quasi polynomial in my input. Suppose I started with the N variate, uh, N variate function. Boolean function, which is an AC0, and is polynomial size. It is a polynomial size uh, AC0 circuit. Then that, so this S is quasi polynomial in the input. Okay. So this is, uh, and each of these DIs are also exponential, uh, quasi polynomial. Okay, so why is that? So you had uh, the symmetric function, you had quasi polynomial in many inputs. So the univariate polynomial, the maximum degree happens to be the, the fanon of this uh, the symmetric, uh, symmetric function. So that is, that is the reason this uh, each of these DIs are also at most positive polynomial. So this is a very well-structured bounded degree uh, algebraic circuit. And we want to prove low bounds against this. So what, uh, so this is first initiated by uh, Forbes, Kumar, and Saptarishi, but they could not show low bounds for this class of circuits. They could show it for bounded depth fluid, where Instead of, instead of powers, they had a uh, product of functions, product of this low degree polynomials, just that this product was also of very low degree, right? So the first thing I did was, so unconditional syntactic lower bounds against this class of, this class of uh, circuits. So I have a polynomial whose Boolean part is in gap L, <coughs> yet it does not have any quasi polynomial sized then four circuits of this form. So that's the first thing. So it's a syntactic lower bound, but it's not functional yet. Right? So then we did not get the entire result that we want because the entire result would mean Sharpie is rather, it separates uh, GAPL from AC0, which is a very strong result. And so, so towards that, we make progress by saying that uh, there's, a, there's a function which is computable in GAPL, but it does not have any small Sigma bar, sigma pi expressions functional, right? So there is a caveat. So, so this is an algebraic circuit. Sigma power, sigma pi is an algebraic circuit. It computes a polynomial, right? So you want to say that you have a function in mind, which is in capital, and you want to show that this function cannot be computed by algebraic expressions of this form, sigma power, sigma pi, right? So. Any polynomial that is computed by sigma per sigma pi that should not be functionally equivalent to my uh, polynomial of interest. So let me just you have a this is a polynomial p and uh, so you have a sigma so this is sums of powers of polynomials. So let me just say. So, so I have a polynomial P of interest. So the Boolean part of uh, P, this belongs to gap L. I'll say what this function is. So I want to say that any, any of the 
So let's say that there's a class of uh, polynomials that are being computed. So, right? so for any circuit of this form, I'll have a polynomial that is output. Right? So I want the ultimate goal is to say that none of the polynomials that are generated like this are functionally equal to this. So if I can show that, then that's a functional lower bound for me. So I want to say no, uh, no poly output, none of these are equivalent functionally to me. So that's the statement we want to make. Right. So however, what we, what we fall short of is that instead of none, we say a subset of them are not functionally equal. If I show, if I make this statement for none, then that will imply sharp is rather gap is not equal to uh, ACC zero, which is a very stronger result than what we are looking for. Sharp is not equal to ACC zero. However, like this none got replaced by all low degree, not low degree, no individual degree. I can have very large degree with respect to the polynomial, the number of variables, just that I want the individual degree to be bounded. So in such situations, we have lower bounds. So this is not a complete result, but this is a, this is a on the way to going to uh, separate sharp P and AC zero. But where in sharp P is a, it could be as good as Gapel, then that would be brilliant. But it could be all the way till sharp P. So this, so we say instead of done, we say for any polynomial that is generated by these algebraic circuits, which are bounded individual degree. So those cannot be functionally equal to my polynomial of interest or a function of interest. So this is a result on the way, you can call it incremental, but there is like things which are wide open. So either you can, you can look at a polynomial which is in Gapel or you can look at a polynomial which is in Sharpe. Right, so there is a polynomial which is related to permanent for which again, you can get no bounds of this form. So the, the caveat and for this result happens to be this, I cannot get this none yet at this point of time. So this is where I said like, you know, there's a big open question. So rather we get uh, something which says, oh, look at all those polynomials, which are bounded into individual degree and are generated by this kind of circuits. Those cannot be functionally equal to my polynomials, which are either in Gap, uh, Gapel or Sharpe. Can you translate this? Bounded individual degree on the output polynomial. Can you somehow translate that to restrictions on the degrees of this Q and this D? Ah, so it can be. So I can actually. So this is a this is a very strange notion in the sense that uh, I can have. So if I if I put restrictions on this, then it will tell me that I cannot generate terms of this which are high uh, high degree. But what the output polynomial being high. Uh, I can actually generate terms which are very high degree and then they could get cancelled out and give me a low degree polynomial. Right, so which is why I do not want to place a restriction on either uh, Q, D's or Q's, right? So it doesn't stop me to generate high degree polynomials. Is that the, the term should cancel out and give me a low degree polynomial. So one of the, uh, okay, so, so the reason why algebraic circuit complexity got really famous was if you look at this algorithm to compute determinant, so there is this, so it started with uh, Berkowitz and uh, so there are two, two other people. So then, and then it got refined by Mahajan Mane. So they compute determinant and it uses cancellations very crucially. So one, one of the reasons why we study algebraic complexity is we, we think that this, because of this algebraic structure, cancellations could help. So here, like implicitly, you're using that, like, you, know, you can generate very high degree terms, but you want them to cancel and give me a low degree problem. So this is a very unnatural restriction, but unfortunately we are stuck. We, we are making progress, but we are stuck with. So if I look at the syntactic low bounds for, if I don't talk about functional low bounds, this none is fine. It's in the same paper, but it's like none is fine if I look at the syntactic low bounds. But if I actually look at uh, just the functional low bounds, this none, I cannot prove anything yet. I'll only look at uh, I'll only look at uh, polynomials which are generated by 
circuits of this form, which are bounded individually. So that's the kind of uh, low bounds that you can show. Right, so, yeah, so the main result is happens to be this. There's a function which is computable in Gapel, yet it cannot be functionally equivalent to some of the outputs of this class of polynomials. Right, and the function, so, so this again, I'll skip the proof. If you're interested, I can talk about it. But the function happens to be something called iterated matrix multiplication. Right, so there's a problem which is studied uh, very well studied in uh, Boolean complexity. Right, so so what is this? this is nothing but you have uh, so you can think of it as a one cross one comma one entry of a product of d many matrices. So I have this uh, this source to sink graph, and each layer is a complete uh, bipartite graph. Right, and uh, each edge has a weight. So each edge has a weight which is a variable, distinct variable. Okay. So you are, uh, you can think. One way to think about this is it's a one comma one entry in the product of d many matrices uh, which have variables. Every entry is a distinct variable. I have uh, d n square many distinct variables. I take product of these d many matrices. Each is of size n cross n. And the one comma one entry in that is my the poly, the polynomial of interest. So either you can take it, take it as a one comma one entry, you can also take it as a trace of this matrix. That's fine. The trace of the uh, product matrix, right? and this keeps coming up in a lot of places. So this also happens to be complete for a small class in algebraic complexity. So if you want to state it as a source to sink, sink graph, then you can. That is nothing but the weights of all source to sink paths. And uh, the weight is nothing but the product of all the edge weights on this path. Right, so this is a very well studied polynomial and it has small size circuits. So basically the way the proof goes is like defining a complexity measure and uh, so I have two minutes wait, like I'll just end this. Right, so, so most of these proofs go, go with a measure and it, what measure you use is so in this paper, we use something which is very complicated, but it needs to capture the notion of functional equivalence. Right, so all this says is define a measure such that it is easy for the circuit class and hard for the polynomial signals. So rather, whatever, so if you apply that measure, your, your uh, the value, the order, the output value you have for that function should be low for the circuits of this kind. And for the polynomials of interest, it should be high, right? So that's a kind of, uh, so it is what is called a shift, multilinear shift evaluation dimension, but that's a completely different story, but yeah, so all these proofs are measure theoretic. Not measure theoretic, that, that means something else. So using measures, right? So these are algebraic measures. So these measures came, so the origin of these measures, the way they are, so the first it started as a partial derivative measure, which was given by uh, Nissan and Wilkerson, and then it moved to uh, uh, shifted partial derivatives by Neeraj Kair, and it became it took multiple shapes, and now it is what it is. So things get complicated over time. I don't think that it should be this complicated. Things should be much simpler. And there is a reason. Okay, so if you ask me why there is a restriction of that sort. The restriction is because of some uh, application of Taylor series. So I can talk more about it. So basically we have polynomials and we want to talk about functional equivalence. So polynomials are algebraic objects, but the equivalence is functionally sort. So you take something which is algebraic and make functional. There is something which is lost in translation. Right? So the entire game is about trying to minimize this loss. So the way the bounds work is saying that I have a partial derivative matrix or shifted partial derivative matrix that I can define on these polynomials. If two, two polynomials are functionally equivalent, their uh, evaluation matrix will also be, may not be equal, but you can make them equal using certain 
So you see this lot multilinear, this uh, multiplication by shifts and everything. These are to bring together the algebraic and functional objects together. And if, if you are interested, I can talk more after the talk. So if it is a partial derivative matrix, the partial derivative matrix is defined by the rows are defined by monomials on half the number of variables. And the, uh, or yeah, the rows are defined by monomials on half the number of variables. The columns are defined by monomials on the rest of the half of the variables. And each entry is defined by the coefficient of the product of these monomials. So this is a uh, definition given by us. From, from the partial derivative matrix, you can go to the evaluation matrix where you can say, oh, I'm going to fix my rows to be indexed by uh, the evaluations of the variables, which are half of half the number of variables. And my columns are defined by evaluations, which are for the rest of the variables. And uh, so I have half the uh, assignments in, the, in, my row, in my row index, half the assignments in my column index. I put these both of them together. And uh, my entry, which is in the matrix, is given by putting together the assignments given by the row index and the column index. Right? So this is kind of, okay, so I'm going to skip it because I need to spend a few more minutes on this. So there is a measure. The measure, the broad theme is, the measure is small for the circuit and large for the target polynomial. So this is just like stating things uh, mathematically. So this K, uh, yeah, so this R is the bound on the individual degree. And the, so for a specific regime of parameters, you have, so when I said, like, instead of none, I have some restrictions, that restrictions are given by R and D. So the individual degree could be as large as uh, D by K square, and this K, implicitly goes into the exponent. So you cannot have K to be very small. If you have K to be very small, then it affects your low bound. So you want to enter the K to be at least quasi polynomial. Right? So K is at least uh, log. So yeah, so, the, so there is, the cleanest way to state this is in terms of parameter K. So you can get a trade-off. Either you want to have, either you want to weaken the restriction on this and get a smaller lower bound, or you want to get a, get a stronger lower bound and make the restriction on this uh, circuit stronger. Right? So that's the way to uh, state this. Yeah, so that's where I'll stop for a while. Yeah, so this iterative matrix multiplication, it can be simulated using uh, GAPL. So this is a very well studied uh, problem. So this is also related to reachability and stuff. So this is, uh, so basically it's like GAPL versus Rather, it's, it's, it's much smaller than GAPL. So people in uh, algebraic community, algebraic complexity community call it SSC zero, which is, I don't like the notation called SSC zero, but yeah, something smaller than GAPL versus uh, sharp P. It's not P versus MP, of course. So this is like a much coarser separation. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Yeah, so sorry.